Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we're taking a look at VRM thermal performance on eight entry level Intel Z590 motherboards. And I'm talking about entry level Z590 motherboards. So not entry level motherboards in general. And that means prices do start at $170 US or $250 Australian. So these boards aren't exactly cheap and therefore you wanna make sure you're getting a good one. And as you're about to see, when it comes to VRM performance, there are a few models that certainly lag behind the pack. Now, before we get into the results, let's very quickly take a look at each one of these boards VRM design, the cooling and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, I think we'll start with the cheapest board here, the ASRock Phantom Gaming 4. When discussing the Z590 Phantom Gaming 4, it is important to remember that this is the cheapest model available at $170 US. So at least relative to the other Z590 motherboards, it is cheap. The problem I have with this board and perhaps the entire Z590 range is the fact that for what is really quite a bit of money, you're not getting much motherboard. I've seen better equipped IO on Intel NUX, so it's pretty damn horrible for an ATX motherboard. You get a handful of USB ports, three audio jacks, a PS2 port, and an HDMI output, and that's it. But I guess we're here for the VRM, and I can tell you that it's not much better, nor is the cooling. Installed over the discrete Sinopower MOSFETs are two of the smallest VRM heatsinks you're likely ever to find featured on an ATX motherboard. Removing them reveals a six-phase V-core, with each phase featuring two Sinopower SM4508 FETs on the low side and two SM4503 FETs on the high side, each feeding into a pair of inductors. So at least there's a dozen low side and a dozen high side FETs, but I'm still not expecting good things from this board. Now, if you've got $15 more to throw on a motherboard, ASRock does offer the slightly better looking Z590 Pro 4, though oddly this board does away with the USB Type-C port on the IO panel. The only upgrades here include a DisplayPort output and perhaps more importantly a 2.5 gigabit LAN port using the Realtek Dragon RTL 8125BG controller, which admittedly I have no experience with. So in terms of onboard features, the Pro 4 is a reasonable upgrade at $185 US. Really the biggest upgrade here though has been made to the VRM, and that's important for our testing. The board still features a six phase vCore VRM, but this one has been upgraded with 50 amp Vachet SIC 654 power stages. And again, we're getting two per phase, feeding into a pair of inductors. Not only has ASRock upgraded the current handling capabilities, but they've also strapped on some decent heat sinks, which they've also clamped down using screws rather than plastic clips, and that drastically increases the mounting pressure. So the Pro 4 looks decent, but let's move on. And moving on to the ASUS boards, we have their most affordable ATX model, the Prime Z590-P. At the time of making this video, it costs $5 more than the ASRock Pro 4 at $190 US. Again, the IO panel isn't particularly impressive, though it is slightly better than the Pro 4. The cooling also appears more substantial with two fairly large heat sinks, and the board itself is noticeably heavier. Under the heat sinks though, we do find a pretty mediocre vCore VRM comprised of alpha and omega 50 amp power stages. And in total, there are 10 which have been paired up for a five phase vCore. I feel like had ASUS included a six phase that this board would be quite good at $190 US, but with just 10 power stages in total, I'm not expecting it to perform all that well, despite the large heat sinks. But of course, we'll check that out soon. For now, let's check out the more expensive ASUS Tough Gaming Z590 Plus. This board is quite a big jump up in price at $240 US, so $50 more than the Prime Z590P. There's also an even more expensive $260 version offering Wi-Fi support, and that's actually the model I have in for testing. But since the VRM, cooling, and the rest of the board remains the same, I'll quote pricing for the base model, given that we're not that interested in the Wi-Fi support for this testing. In terms of rear IO, the Tough Gaming really isn't much of an upgrade over the Prime Z590P. And in fact, if you get the base model without Wi-Fi, there's virtually nothing extra on offer here. There are some upgrades to the feature list. The 2.5 gigabit LAN now uses an Intel controller rather than Realtek, for example. However, it is the VRM that I'm most interested in. And here we find a significant upgrade. ASUS is still using 50 amp power stages, but this time they are from OnSemi and there's 14 of them in total and they're configured in pairs for a seven phase vCore. So a significantly greater current capacity, which should drastically improve the VRM thermal performance of this model. 
Next up, we have the MSI Z590A Pro. And ever since canning the Z390 version of this board, MSI has made sure that their most entry-level model isn't an embarrassment. Priced at $190 US, it's certainly not the cheapest model we have in for testing, but it's still one of the cheaper models we have. Matching the ASUS Prime Z590P, ASRock Z590 Pro 4, and the Gigabyte Z590UD that we're still yet to look at. In terms of features, the board's surprisingly good. Not only do you get Intel 2.5 gigabits per second LAN, but they've also included eight USB ports on the I.O. panel. Admittedly, half of which are USB 2.0, but still, it's nice to see more than half a dozen ports on offer. Where the Z590A Pro looks the most impressive, though, is the VRM. The V-Core portion features a dozen Alpha and Omega 55 amp power stages. These are higher rated and more efficient power stages than what ASUS used on the similarly priced Prime Z590P, and there's two more of them. MSI has also included some rather large heat sinks as well, so this should be an entry-level Z590 motherboard to be on the lookout for when we get to the thermal testing shortly. As was the case with the ASUS Z590 range, we find that MSI's does jump up quite a bit in price for the next best model. The MSI Z590 Torpedo comes in at $240 US, so the same price as the ASUS Tough Gaming Z590 Plus. When compared to the Tough Gaming, the Torpedo offers an extra USB 3.2 port on the I.O. panel and a second LAN port, though it's just a 1 gigabit connection, but it's in addition to a 2.5 gigabit port driven by an Intel controller. The Torpedo is a premium looking board, and really it should be at this price point, though I'm not sure how popular the blue heat sinks will be, though I have to admit it is kind of nice seeing a motherboard with a bit of character. The blue heat sinks are huge though, and under them you'll find an impressive 7 phase V core VRM. MSI is used on semi 60 amp power stages per phase, meaning there are 14 for just the V core portion. So I expect this to be one of the best performers of the group. Now, for Gigabyte and their most entry-level ATX Z590 motherboard, we have the Z590UD, which at the time of making this video could be had for $190 US. When compared to the MSI Z590A Pro, the I.O. panel is pretty similar, though it does drop the USB Type-C connectivity and a number of audio jacks. But the I.O. shield is pre-installed, so that's a nice little bonus there. The board itself looks decent, featuring the typical black and grey theme. The VRM heat sinks look nice though only the larger primary heatsink is fixed into place using screws for maximum mounting pressure. Of course, it's what's under the heatsinks that's the most important thing, and here we find a massive 12 phase V-Core VRM, with each phase driven by a Vichet SIC 651A 50 amp power stage. In total, there are 12 power stages, so while not the most extreme V-Core VRM we've seen so far, it's still mighty impressive given the price point. Then finally we have the Gigabyte Z590 Gaming X which jumps up to $210 US, so just $20 more than the UD, and I've got to say for that small price increase you get what looks to be a much better motherboard. The I.O. panel has been upgraded to include a USB Type-C port along with 6 audio jacks, and of course the I.O. shield is still pre-installed. The VRM heatsinks have also been upgraded and they're now quite a bit bigger, which is a little bit ironic given that the power stages have also been upgraded, making them more efficient, which means they'll output less heat. But that's how these things seem to go. So the Gigabyte Gaming X still uses a dozen Vachet power stages in a 12 phase configuration, but this time we find the 60 amp versions. So the Gaming X should be slightly better than the UD in terms of VRM thermal performance. So with that, let's get into the results. Actually, before we get to the graphs, we need to talk a little bit about the test conditions. For this testing and any future LGA 1200 VRM thermal testing, I've built a dedicated system inside the Corsair 5000D airflow case. Powering it, we have the RM850X power supply, and for the cooling, we have the Corsair IQ H150i Elite Capilix White. The 5000D has been configured with a single rear 120mm exhaust fan, and then we have a single 120mm in the front, acting as an intake fan. Then at the top of the case is the H150i 360mm radiator with three 120mm exhaust fans. This is a pretty standard configuration, airflow is good, and in a 21 degree room I'd say it's a fairly optimal setup. For recording temperatures I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples, and I'll be reporting the peak rear PCB temperature. Finally, I'm not reporting delta T over ambient, instead I maintain a room temperature of 21 degrees, and to ensure a consistent ambient temperature, a thermocouple is positioned next to the test system. Now for this testing, I've got three configurations using two different 11th gen processors. The first test uses a stock Core i9-11900K, 
as I'm interested to see how each of these boards configures this processor. Then of course I'll overclock the 11900K for a stress test, and then for a more relaxed stress test I'll also be including the 11600K, both of which will be overclocked to 4.9 GHz using 1.35 volts. Then for stress testing, I'm using the Blender Gooseberry workload, which will be run for an hour, at which point I'll reporting the maximum PCB temperature, again using K-type thermocouples. Okay, so here's a look at the VRM thermal performance using a stock Intel Core i9-11900K processor. And the first thing you'll want to note here is the fact that this isn't an apples to apples test. The sustained CPU all core frequency can vary quite a bit with the ASRock boards being by far the worst, although they are running within the Intel spec. Basically, ASRock's decided to limit their entry level Z590 motherboards to the Intel base spec, so the 125 watt TDP. It's worth noting that they're the only board partner to do this with ASUS, Gigabyte and MSI all running the 11900K at between 4.7 GHz and 4.8 GHz depending on the board. Normally ASRock doesn't power limit their boards and I believe this isn't the case for their more expensive models, though I am yet to test them. So has ASRock just decided to follow the Intel specification or are they lacking confidence in the design of these lower end boards? Out of interest, I did remove the power limits using the XTU software and that saw the 11900K boost up to an all-core frequency of roughly 4.8 GHz on the Phantom Gaming 4. The only issue being that this saw temperatures skyrocket to 101 degrees, a 28 degree increase over what the board did out of the box with the 125 watt TDP limits enforced. So if you want the same uncapped out of the box experience that you'll receive on the ASUS Prime Z590P, Gigabyte Z590UD or the MSI Z590A Pro with the Phantom Gaming 4, you'll have to be okay with dangerously high VRM temperatures. Even the ASUS Prime Z590P wasn't particularly impressive hitting 78 degrees, but at least the 11900K wasn't power limited here. Still, that almost 80 degree operating temperature looks quite bad next to the Gigabyte Z590UD and MSI Z590A Pro, both of which ran at around 60 degrees, though admittedly they were running the 11900K 100 megahertz slower. So for a more apples to apples comparison, let's move on to the OC results. Okay, so with all boards overclocked to 4.9 GHz, power consumption for just the CPU increased between 219 and 229 watts, depending on the model. Now it's worth noting that none of these boards power throttled the 11900K after an hour of stress testing in Blender, which is reasonably impressive. Though for some reason the ASRock boards had trouble maintaining 4.9 GHz exactly, still they didn't throttle so this saw a pass for both the Phantom Gaming 4 and Pro 4. Of course the Phantom Gaming 4 operating temperature is less than ideal, hitting 112 degrees on the rear side of the PCB, and that's not an internal component temperature which is bound to be at least 10 degrees hotter. The ASUS Prime Z590P which wasn't exactly impressive was considerably better than the Phantom Gaming 4 peaking at 96 degrees. And then we have the ASRock Z590 Pro 4, which was cooler again at 86 degrees. And while that's an acceptable result, it's really not great, especially relative to similarly priced Z590 motherboards from the likes of Gigabyte and MSI. For example, the Gigabyte Z590 UD peaked at just 74 degrees, while the Gaming X version was only slightly better at 73 degrees. The MSI Z590A Pro was slightly better again, peaking at 70 degrees, while the Torpedo ran at just 68 degrees, and then the best result came from the ASUS Tough Gaming Z590 Plus, which peaked at 67 degrees. Now to be fair, all boards that ran between 67 and 74 degrees were excellent, and these results are near enough to call a tie. So when it comes to VRM thermal performance, they're all much of a muchness, and you'd purchase based on stuff like features, design, price, and so on. But before wrapping up the testing, here's a quick look at how they fare with an overclocked 11600K. For those of you who never intend on pairing your Z590 motherboard with a 11900K or believe you'll be stress testing the CPU for extended periods of time, this is how they got on with the Core i5 11600K. Basically, all boards passed with relative ease, even the Phantom Gaming 4 peaked just shy of 80 degrees. Then we see that the rest of the pack ran at well under 70 degrees, which is very comfortable, and you'd have no issue running these boards 24-7 with an overclocked 11600K. So that's how the most affordable Z590 motherboards from each brand performs, and overall, I think they were quite good, surprisingly good even, though they really should be given the price. There was only one truly awful board here, one that you absolutely need to avoid, and that is of course the ASRock Z590 Phantom Gaming 4, and 
while I would normally cut the cheapest offering some slack, I really feel that this is something Azeroth needs to stop doing. I assume they're trying to capture buyers by offering the absolute cheapest Z590 board, but in my opinion, they're just taking advantage of their customers. As the Phantom Gaming 4, at least this version of the Phantom Gaming 4, really should be a B560 board, not a Z590. The idea of Z590 is to offer CPU overclocking, namely for flagship parts, the, the K-SKU parts, and running at well over 100 degrees in a cool room using a well-ventilated case is completely unacceptable. Therefore, you're always going to be far better off coming up with an extra $20 to land the MSI Z590A Pro or Gigabyte Z590UD, even if you only plan on running a Core i5 part, they're just much better quality boards. The other issue I have with these ASRock boards is the fact that they enforce the 125W TDP limit out of the box. And I wonder, is this a case for all ASRock Z590 motherboards, or just the most affordable models? Unfortunately, I don't yet have an answer to that one, but I have purchased the higher end models, so I'll be able to test those shortly. If ASRock has removed the power limits on their more expensive Z590 boards, this creates a bit of an unfortunate scenario where you don't really know what kind of performance their Z590 boards offer out of the box. You could be looking at an all-core frequency of 4.3 GHz or 4.8 GHz or really anything in between. And it's my opinion that at the end of the day, the Z590 chipset is meant to be a premium product. So sticking it on a trash board like the Phantom Gaming 4 is something any credible board partner should avoid. Thankfully, the ASRock Z590 Pro 4 is a lot better, at least compared to the Phantom Gaming 4, but next to the competing MSI and Gigabyte boards, it's a bit of a hard pass. In terms of value, the Gigabyte Z590UD and MSI Z590A Pro are hard to beat, and I'd argue that they can't really be beat. The ASUS Prime Z590P is extremely underwhelming at $190, the feature set is very weak, and the VRM performance was unimpressive, so I'd also pass on that one. The ASUS Tough Gaming Z590 Plus, on the other hand, is excellent, but it's also quite pricey at $240 US, though that does seem to be the going price for a decent Z590 motherboard. The MSI Z590 Torpedo was also very competitive at this price point, while the Gigabyte Z590 Gaming X is uncontested at $210 US. Overall, if you're looking for an affordable yet high quality Z590 motherboard, I'd recommend the MSI Z590A Pro, and then as a backup, the Gigabyte Z590UD. If you've got a bit more money to spend and you want a few extra features and a better quality VRM, the ASUS Tough Gaming Z590 Plus or MSI Z590 Torpedo would be my go-to options. And that's going to do it for this look at the more entry-level Z590 motherboards. If you like this video, you know what to do. Subscribe for more content. I will be looking at eight more Z590 motherboards, the next two expensive options from each brand. And we'll also look at some higher end boards later on. And if you guys would like me to, I will purchase all the, uh, well, the cheaper, eight of the cheapest B560 boards, because that seems like the way to go for the uh, more popular 11th gen parts like the 11400, 11400F and all that, those sort of CPU. So if you want me to do that testing, I guess I will. I, I hadn't planned on it originally, but it seems like B560 testing probably makes the most sense now. Anyway, like, subscribe, I think I've said that. If you'd like to support this testing and just the Harbour on Box channel in general and get some really cool perks in return, Floatplane or Patreon, links for those in the video description, you will get access to our exclusive Discord server, uh, monthly live streams with Tim and myself, that's coming up shortly, Q&As, behind the scenes videos, a lot of cool stuff there. So yeah, if you're interested, check it out. As I said, links are in the video description. But if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.